All righty. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our Instagram Live today. Uh, my name is Tahira Allen. I'm a science communicator at NASA. And as I'm sure some of you, maybe most of you all have seen by now, the James Webb Space Telescope has released some beautiful full color first images. And so if you're not familiar with it, the James Webb Space Telescope is now the world's most powerful space telescope. We're going to be talking a little bit about Webb today and about some of its new images. If you have not seen the new first images from James Webb, I really encourage you after today's event to head on over to the NASA Webb account and just be blown away, honestly. I mean, these are the crispest, most distant images of the universe taken to date. And so this leads me to the topic of today's conversation. So today we are going to learn how these images come to life. So we're gonna be talking with two web team members. We have Joseph D. Pasquale, and then we have Elisa Pagan. They uh, are responsible for translating the black and white uh, image data from the space telescope into these beautiful, beautiful full color images that we are all familiar with. We are also going to be joined today by colorblind content creator Natasha Caudle. Natasha actually sees our world in black and white and similarly uses tools to translate the colors around her into things that she can understand. And so this is going to be a really good conversation today. Thank you so much for joining. If you could be patient with me, I am going to uh, invite some of our special guests in. But while I do this, let's take this as a moment to get to know each other. If you are tuning in live right now, go ahead and drop either where you're watching from or if you have a favorite web image, drop all of that into the comment right now and the second half of today's event. So if you have anything that you wanna ask our experts, Feel free to drop it in. We have friends. Uh, we have friends monitoring the chats to do that. All righty, one more. All right, y'all. We are about to rock and roll. Okay. All right. Well, hello. It looks like we already have two of our special guests here. Uh, we have. Joe, we have Joe on the Space Telescope um, account, and then we also have Elisa on the NASA Web account, and now we have Natasha here. So the gang is all here. Let's get started. Uh, I want to start by just introducing the people that bring you bring these Web Telescope images to life. So we have Joseph D. Pasquale, and we have Elisa. Pagan, both from the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. So Joe, Elisa, I'm going to kick it off you, to you. If you could just do a quick introduction, who you are and what you do with Web. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe DePesquale. I am the uh, Senior Science Visuals Developer in the Office of Public Outreach at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And what that means is my job is to take the raw data from the Hubble and the Web Space Telescopes and to turn that into the uh, press release imagery that we put out for our press releases or for outreach products. Um, I graduated from Villanova University with a degree in astronomy and astrophysics, and I've been working professionally in astronomy for 21 years. Um, I also have some training in art and music and photography, which all sort of comes together for the, uh, the work that we do here. Yeah, and I'm Elisa Pagan. I'm also a science visuals developer. I work closely with Joel making the full color images. And just a little bit of context and background about me. I have a background in art and science. So my first degree was actually in art and design at Towson University. And then after that, I decided I wanted to do something different, uh, astronomy. So I pursued a degree in astronomy at the University of Maryland in College Park. Didn't really know how these two paths were going to collide, uh, but, you know, took the chance. And then I finally took observational astronomy, and that's where things kind of came together for me. I took my first observations, uh, did my, performed my own data analysis, and then I kind of dawned on me that there are people out there who produce these beautiful color images of space, and I'm like, how do I get to do that? Uh, and then I learned about Space Telescope Science Institute after I graduated, and that is the head of science operations for Hubble and now Webb. And I pretty much just stalked their uh, ad job ad <laughs> page uh, until this job popped up, and uh, and here we are. 
I love that. Thank you both so much. And then our next special guest is Natasha Caudle. Natasha, can you tell us a little bit about this, about yourself and what you do? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Natasha, and I am a content creator on TikTok and Instagram. I was born with a very rare eye condition called achromatopsia. So in addition to just winning the eyesight lottery and having the worst eyesight possible, uh, I'm also completely colorblind. And it just so happens that all of my favorite hobbies and activities also happen to be the most colorful hobbies and activities. Um, and so um, I share videos about what it's like to go shopping and to do my makeup and to create art as somebody who only sees in black and white, um, as well as just making videos educating about blindness and accessibility. Thank you so much, Natasha. And I, we spoke about this a little bit earlier, but I think it is so cool how you use your platform to really just be a window into your world and especially for education and things like that. And I would kind of say that's the same thing that we're really trying to do with these space telescopes just to the universe. And um, I think, it might be a surprise to some people to know that our space telescopes actually see in black and white as well. And so <laughs> I know, right? Let's go. And so Joe, could you actually break that down a little bit for us and explain that? Sure. Yeah. So the Hubble and Webb telescopes, they both have detectors on them that are sensitive to intensities of light, but not color. And so really they're designed to just measure the brightness of different objects in space. The color comes into play uh, through the use of filters. <clears throat> and this isn't like Instagram filters. This is a physical mechanism on the telescope that uh, rotates a filter into the field of view between the, the light and the detector. So it's kind of like, like wearing like glasses that make things look red and blue, like old 3D movie glasses, things like that. Uh, so you can take pictures in different wavelengths of light. And so for web, we're looking at all infrared light. But within that, we're looking at small bands of infrared light. And we can use that to color the data and pull it all together to make the color images that we now see from web and, and what we've been seeing from Hubble for many years. Okay, wow, you know, that wouldn't be, you would think that it just comes down, like pretty colorful, beautiful process. And um, Alyssa, do you have anything to either add to that or could you explain why we are even adding this color? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so as Joe mentioned, we apply or we prescribe colors, a specific color that best represents that wavelength. And we usually do this in chromatic order. And that just means that we assign sort of the longest wavelength, the redder color, and then the shortest wavelength, the bluer color, and then green in between. That's just how our visible spectrum works. Uh, but if we're talking about like why we make these color images to begin with is that we're getting specific information and detail in each of these filters. It's telling us something about the science and the processes that are happening in these objects. So you get a lot more for the price of one, essentially. You're getting all these filters, you're combining them together, and then you start to see with the colors where the distribution of maybe these, you know, molecules are or just the how hot the gas is or the dust. And so you're actually learning a lot more just by being able to see a color image. And it's not just helpful for scientists, but it's actually helpful for the general public because it just helps you translate these scientific discoveries and get people more engaged and it makes it more accessible. Okay, so this is really cool. So it is not just pure aesthetics, you know, like we are learning something from these colors. And Natasha, I want to know how was your experience with the web images? How did it, how do they look for you? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's funny. I've literally always been colorblind. And so I never really considered that every time I looked at a space image, I was seeing it in black and white and everybody else was seeing whatever colors the universe is. Um, but I love looking at them anyway. I think the thing that I love about these new images is how much more detail we're getting in them. And I get to see all of the like texture within the images. Um, one of my favorite images actually is like the cosmic cliffs where it's almost like you're looking at a mountain range, but you're looking at like the universe. Um, and I just love it because there's so much to look at. Um, and I'm seeing, you know, you've got like the dark background and then the lighter, you know, the, the kind of lighter everything that the telescope is picking up. And it's just, it's really interesting to look at, um, even in black and white. No, that's cool. And I really like how you called out textures here because I'm wondering, you know, is that, first of all, I guess let's back this up. First of all, is what, how Natasha described seeing these images, would you kind of say that that is how the raw unprocessed image looks? Like, are we, is our space telescope seeing basically what Natasha's seeing? 
Well, N Natasha is, when she's seeing the images that we've processed, they, they've gone through a, a lot of steps of processing, of cleaning up the data. And so she's getting sort of like a black and white version of the cleanest possible version of the image. Mm -hmm. um, it, the telescope sees like in a single filter, it would be, you know, the light of a specific wavelength of infrared light. So it's a little bit different, but I think generally speaking, yeah, like a black and white image is basically what the telescope sees. And for Webb, it's infrared, which is, you know, it's light that our eyes are not sensitive to. Uh, so, you know, at least and I translate that light into something that we can see using the same principles that we would use with Hubble, which is an optical telescope, seeing the light that our eyes are sensitive to. So is there a rhyme or reason to the color palettes that we are putting on these space telescopes? Yeah, and so I mentioned a little bit before um, about the chromatic order, and that's just because it's the closest scientifically. It has the most scientifically valuable meaning. And so, again, we're, chromatic order just means we're assigning colors from longest to shortest, so red to blue, essentially. And then this translation is very direct, right, for Hubble or visible imagery. Uh, if you have, like, a red filter that's covering the red part of the spectrum, you assign it red and so on, and you get, like, a color image that's very natural or very close to what we'd actually see, if we had ours as powerful as Hubble, that is. Now, when you're talking about web, however, you know, invisible light, it's like, okay, so how does this work? We still assign things in chromatic order, so they're still longer and shorter wavelengths, right? We're just transcribing it into the visible part of the spectrum. And, like, I like to think of it as music because you're keeping the relationship between the wavelengths the same. So let's say you're in an octave that's like beyond your hearing, you know, only your dogs can hear it and they're like running around. And then you take that music and then you transcribe it to a different octave. So that's like the process of taking infrared into visible. That's what I like to think of it. Okay, cool. I really, that was a great kind of analogy. And Natasha, I understand that you also use tools to translate the colors around you. Can you explain a little bit about how that works and uh, how you use that? Yeah, well, so I love the point that was made in, in that the, you know, color, coloring these images isn't just aesthetically, you know, we're learning a lot about these images through the colors. Um, and I feel like that's, that's how I feel a lot of the time, because I get asked pretty much all the time, you know, like, if you can't see color, like, why do you even care what color something is? Like, why do you want to know what color the shirt you're wearing is? Like, why does that even matter to me? Um, and like, I think the answer is that you can infer a lot about color. And like, I do want to know what color I'm sh shirt I'm wearing, not only because, you know, I think in general, people just want to know that. But like, if I'm wearing, you know, a yellow shirt, maybe it's because I'm feeling happy that day. And so, you know, there's just so much more um, to infer. But my, my favorite tool, aside from people who can actually see color, <laughs> is um, I have an app on my phone that I believe was developed for painters. Um, so they could like scan colors and get the exact paint matches that they needed for like painting a house. Um, and I started using it. And so I can, I can point to my phone camera at really anything and the app will tell me what color it is. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's, it's really about like, sometimes I do want to know what color I want to make sure my outfit is matching. Um, you know, I want to make sure if I'm painting a picture of something and I want it to be like accurate that I'm not painting you know, the sky green, like, because the sky's not green. Um, and, and so, you know, it's important to get the, that accuracy. <laughs> no, absolutely. And so are there any other, you know, things that help make products more accessible for you? Yeah, um, I mean, I think a big thing, you know, I love doing makeup and makeup companies love to put, you know, cute little names with all of their like products. Like, you know, this is like Apple Sunshine. And I'm like, that's great. But I don't know what color <laughs> Apple Sunshine is. Like what color am I putting on my face? And it's almost as if like the web images came out and NASA scientists like just didn't describe them at all to anyone. And we had no idea what we were looking at. Um, and so, you know, I wish that I could go to a store and every tag on clothing would tell me the color um, of what that clothing item was. And that if I bought a makeup palette at the store, I knew what colors I was putting on my eyes. Um, just, you know, because it makes my life a lot easier and it makes, you know, it would make my whole life like just more independent as well, since I wouldn't have to rely on other people to figure out all these colors. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you're not the only one out here that I'm sure feels like that. And so I just think it's such a good point to make. And so on that note, you know, you brought up the web images and what if we didn't have anybody here describing them? And that is something that we really are trying to focus on here at NASA is alt text. 
Um, and so for those that are watching, if you don't know what alt text is, they are descriptions of uh, media, I would say, like images, or you can do it for GIFs. And then also a screen reader will then read aloud the text. And so that way different communities can experience them. Um, whether the blind or visually impaired communities can also, you know, understand what's going on and just join us in all of the excitement and the things that we're putting out. And so back to my point though, Natasha, I wanted to know, did you have a chance to read the web alt text? Um, and like, is there anything that, like how, how, does it, how do image descriptions, I guess, play a role in, um, in your life? Yeah, the, I think the web um, alt descriptions are incredible. Like they're just so detailed. They, you know, it's, it's telling me everything that's in the photo as well as the colors. And like, that's a really big thing for me is I can scroll through Twitter and I can look at a photo, I can zoom in on it. It looks cool. But most of the time, I'm not going to know what color it is. And I'm probably not even going to think about what color it is. Um, but with these web images, like I'm able to click on the alt text in the bottom corner and I can like actually read about what these images are. And, you know, Elisa made the point earlier that based on the colors of these images, we can like learn a lot about what we're looking at and we can make inferences about what we're looking at. And so it's kind of exciting that I can get to do that too. And so, you know, the fact that, that NASA is really, you know, out here trying to make science more accessible is, is just really great because it's, this is something that previously, like most of the time when I, you know, even if I go to like a science museum or something, I'm not getting these like really great descriptions from the people who know these photos best. And so I, I love the alt text. <laughs> I'm glad you said that, like, you know, actually from the people that know this, the content best. Elisa, Joseph, were y'all involved in making the alt text descriptions for web or how to, are you just pure visuals? Yeah, it was kind of like divvied up since it was such a compressed timeline. So the writers are actually, the writers in the outreach, the Office of Public Outreach took charge on that and did an awesome, incredible job. Really took tons of time to make sure that they really captured like the majesty and the science behind it. So thank you, writers. <laughs> I know, right? No, absolutely. <laughs> Shout out writers because yeah. I read that alt text and it was amazing. Um, and so I am actually going to take two seconds. I'll come back with some of my own questions, but we do have a lot of questions just coming in from the audience. So I'm going to pivot. I got a handy little tablet right here. So if I'm looking away, that's what I'm doing. Um, but, and for those of you that are just tuning in, just as a reminder, have a chat with us. Like you are welcome to drop questions into the chat stream that's going on right now. We have Elisa and Joseph who are uh, two web team members that actually turn the black and white web image data into the colorful images that we're seeing. And we also have Natasha who's a content creator here focuses a lot on just her experiences um, as a colorblind person and then just showing us a window into the world of that she's living. So drop your questions in the chat, but I'm going to get to some of the ones that are already coming in. Uh, let's see. So let's start with Carla underscore Cardenas 05, who asks, how do you distinguish the difference between each type of material on the photo if it's black and white? And so I actually think this relates to both both sides of us right now. And so Joe or Lisa, if y'all want to take it away from web, and then Natasha um, would love to hear your experience, your viewpoint. Yeah, sure. So for web, uh, the filters that we use actually help us to determine what we're looking at. So mm -hmm. if we use a, a narrow band filter, which is something that only sees a very small portion of the spectrum, uh, those are usually tuned to look at light that's being emitted by like very specific things like a hydrogen atom that's under undergoing an atomic transition and it emits a photon of a very specific energy and a very specific wavelength. And so that's one of the ways that we know, like if we take a black and white image in that filter, we know that the, if it's bright in this region in hydrogen, then we know that we're seeing hydrogen light. So that's one of the ways that we're able to determine that. Okay, cool. And what about you, Natasha? I know before you mentioned like textures, um, how are you able to distinguish uh, the difference between things, I guess, on a photo if it's in black and white. Yeah, so and I, I think kind of Joe just mentioned brightness. And so one way that I've always described my vision is that I see in shades of light to dark, so kind of bright to dark. 
Um, and so in the images, I'm seeing, you know, all the areas where it's a lot brighter and the areas where it's, it's a little darker, but it's not like the dark background of space that we're seeing. Um, and so it, it really is about like the detail and the texture. And <laughs> I mean, I think it's funny, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert on science or space at all. And so, you know, I'm looking at these images and I'm seeing all of these patterns in it. Um, and so then, you know, going to the alt text is actually fantastic because then I can, I can look at it and I can say, okay, this is what I'm looking at, you know? Um, and so, you know, it's, it's definitely, I, I think, it's it's different because I, I can't make those inferences immediately based on color, but um, I can still I'm still looking at all the patterns, which still look very cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely, especially with that new Starfield one. Just all you mentioned sparkles earlier, and a hundred percent. And so, okay, let's go to the next one. We have uh, oh, this is a this is a fun one. We have friend dot ette who asks, does the photo end up being different depending who edits it? So I think this one, Elisa, do you want to take this one? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So I, I've been talking a lot about chromatic order. So you'd think like, okay, well, there's like a, you know, definite science to this. So everything should just come out sort of, you know, cut and, like cookie cutter. But it, it does, it is subjective. Um, once you start applying chromatic order, that's where things get a little bit more, you know, artistic. So maybe... You don't want to assign the longest wavelength red. Maybe you want to assign that orange because it creates a more color balancing or natural looking image. So we're treating it as a photographer at this stage. Once we've sort of cleaned up the images and each of their filters and assigned the specific color in chromatic order, we want to, you know, correct the white balance, neutralize the background, all these things that you would normally do if you just took a picture of, you know, your backyard. And that's the steps that we want to take. We're also remembering to preserve the integrity of the data and also to show off as much details as we can by, you know, enhancing the color separation, enhancing those details as much as possible. But again, you know, we are keeping true to the data itself. And yeah. then, yeah, so it changes. Sorry, it does change, I guess is what I was trying to say. No, it's cool because that is such a fun fact. I feel like I've been following web for the past year and this is just a new fact that I've learned and so uh, that's pretty cool probably for our audience as well so let's go to our next one. Oh, I love this one so um, this is from a uh, this is from like a random Instagram user but it says what are some things you'd like the science community to know about accessibility Natasha Oh, that's a fun one. That's a good one. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think a big thing, and, and, and not even for the scientific community, but really everyone else is just the best way to learn about how to make um, things accessible is to actually ask the people who, who need it to be accessible. Um, you know, I've been visually impaired my entire life. I can tell you a lot about being visually impaired, but you know, somebody who's deaf is going to have a completely different experience with, with like science. Um, and so I think just like learning and talking to the, to like disabled communities, I think is, is an incredible way to really learn about how we can make things accessible. Um, and I mean, I think like the web is doing fantastic with, you know, the alt images. I feel like way more connected to this than a lot of other, you know, a, a lot of other times when a scientific discovery is made and it comes out. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> no, that's really, that is really good advice. And so, um, and again, that's what we're hoping to do, you know, at NASA and just get even better with it. So I'm glad that it's kind of like falling in line with what you're suggesting. So let's go to another one. We have, um, and also when I said random Instagram user earlier, I didn't mean that to be, uh, I just didn't want to butcher your Instagram handle. So <laughs> shout out. Thank you. Um, but our next person is from happy. Our next question is from happy Doritos who asks, how long does it usually take to process an image? <laughs> and I think that goes for web. So, yeah. Uh, so that it, it varies greatly um, for all of the first images that we put out for web, the timeline was really compressed. So we allowed ourselves two days for each image. But I've had images that I worked on for Hubble that took um, like a month to put together just because it was like a really big image, like a bunch of different uh, pointings put together to make a mosaic. That's a lot more complicated, but a single like one pointing, one shot in the sky, that can be done in like a matter of a couple hours. So it really varies a lot. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
That is incredible. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that. Let's go to the next one. All righty. Okay, which software do you use to edit these images? Um, and that is from Athar Basky. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's all good. <laughs> Um, so it kind of varies. Uh, Joe and I actually kind of use different methods. We kind of experiment with different things because the data actually you can't treat it the same. Sometimes one method works better than the other. Um, usually like the first stage is to liberate the FITS file. And because actually when you first get the data, it's completely black essentially with like some bits of like bright regions where the stars are. And that's just because the dynamic range of these telescopes is so great. It can see so many different ranges that our eyes can't see that you have to compress it for you to see it. So you have to scale the brightness values and see like those details that are hidden like in the background. So the first thing to do, take that into a program that can liberate the FITS file. That can be FITS Liberator. That can be an astrophotography program called PixInsight. You could do it there too. And you're scaling these brightness values. And then depending on how this section goes, you might want to divert to Photoshop or some other photo editing software. It doesn't have to be. It could be GIMP, um, which is free if people are interested in checking that out. Uh, or you can stay in Pix Insight. It really just sort of depends on how the data is, is working for you, essentially. You're just kind of working with it. And um, and I say Photoshop, and I say that very carefully because I know people hear the word Photoshop, and they're like, fake, you know, when, yeah. you know you're adding, <laughs> taking aliens out. <laughs> but no, it's, it's just it's a photo editing software, and we're not removing anything. We're literally just using that as a tool to stack different filters together to combine the colors and then we're making like contrast adjustments but we're not we're not you know adding or taking anything away you know it's real data <laughs> we're just trying to visualize it as best that we can yeah no absolutely thank you for breaking that down um <laughs> and making that photo stop distinguished uh but and so natasha can you actually walk us through how you create some of your content yeah well so i love kind of the idea that you know, as these images are being colorized, we're, they're doing it in a way that, you know, it's going to be very natural for somebody who can see color to look at these images. Um, and so something that I do on my TikTok is I put a, like, just very basic, like, it, it comes with the iPhone, the black and white noir filter um, on my videos. Because um, I've always told people my vision is like watching a black and white movie. That's probably the best way I can describe it to people. Um, and so I'll put the black and white filter on my videos. And then um, I will put the same video in color because people love being able to actually compare what they're looking at. You know, people love a glimpse into my world, but then they want to like, they want to go back to their nice colorful world as well. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so it, it, it's been really great because, you know, I have uh, a few different types of just, you know, vision issues. And it's very hard to like, explain them to people and so the fact that I can use a filter to actually show people um, a little bit of a glimpse into my world is is really great and and people seem to be really receptive to it so I love that I, I get to share it through that um, and I always tell people this is probably how I see it's probably a little bit more filtered because I don't have like a really like I if you know if I wanted to use a fancier black and white filter I probably could open up Photoshop but you know it's it's doing the job <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you for breaking that down for us. And so I have a question from uh, Jabara who asks, Natasha, do you associate different shades of black or white with colors we commonly see? Yeah, so the way that I kind of do it, so I guess how I could describe it is if I was looking at a rainbow, so you've got the, the seven colors of the rainbow, Red is going to be the darkest shade on the rainbow, and to me, it, that red looks black to me, actually, because it's just a mm -hmm. really, really dark shade. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got, I believe, yellow is in the rainbow. Um, red, orange, yellow. Yeah, yellow is in the rainbow. Okay. Um, <laughs> and yellow actually looks like the lightest shade to me. And so a lot of times, um, if I see something, I'm like, that, that, that looks really light, I'm like, oh, that could be white, but it could also be yellow, because I know that's a really light shade. So even though I'm not seeing the color I'm seeing like the brightness of mm -hmm. it um kind of similar to how the web images are being processed that was going to be my exact follow-up I mean I don't know is there is there a connection there like we were talking when we're talking about infrared wavelengths red wavelengths when it comes down as the original unprocessed data is it close to black how does that work with web uh, well yeah so as Elisa mentioned when we first open a file it basically looks black 
And that again is because the dynamic range of the detector is just so huge that you can't display it on a screen or see it with your eyes. Uh, so it has to be stretched and you have to pull the information out. It's like sort of buried in the darkness. Uh, but once you do that, you do see different shades of mm -hmm. uh, gray, right? So <clears throat> depending on which filter was used, you may see a region that's really shining brightly in a particular filter. And that's telling you that there's enhanced emission of a certain kind of infrared light in a certain region, um, like a spiral galaxy. Actually, spiral galaxies with the near cam look kind of almost uniformly gray. Uh, and that's mainly due to the stars. Yeah, uh, the, the different populations of stars all kind of glow in the same similar way in infrared light. Uh, so you don't get a lot of contrast there. Okay, is this unprocessed data available for folks yes. to just like compare and contrast? Yeah, uh, MAST, the uh, Mikulski Archive at Space Telescope, that is uh, mast.stsci.edu. Uh, from there, that's the archive for all Space Telescope um, missions here that we, that we run. So all of Hubble data is there and all the web data. Um, all of the first images are, are public now. So anyone can go in there and pull the raw data out and look at it for themselves. Okay, cool. Yeah. And so I have a really good question here. How much of your processing work is done manually and how much of it is automated? Uh, Lisa, you want to take that one? That's a good question. So I guess it depends on like what part of the process you're looking at because there's actually kind of two stages of the process. But Joe and I usually deal with the second stage. There's like a pre-processing stage and the post-processing stage. And the pre-processing is like all the calibrations. So like stacking all your images together, improving the signal to noise, all those things, removing some of the artifacts. So that's all like a pipeline. That's all Python. So I would say that's automatic. There is like scientists that actually input certain parameters to get the best result. Um, but I would say that's sort of the more automatic stage. Uh, and then when we're taking it into, for us, I would say it's more manually because like there are some algorithms that we can use to like maybe we want to kind of like quickly make an action in, in Photoshop or a different algorithm that can like help supply things just to make things go faster. But it's it, every every data set is like so distinct that you really want to take the time to process it individually. So I would say our part is very, very, you know, manual and subjective. Yeah. yeah it okay, really becomes great. a by eye kind of thing when we get to that point. Yeah. Okay, yeah. nice. And so is it true that both of you process some of the first images that were released? And if so, <laughs> definitely yeah. want to hear which one is your favorite. Uh, yeah, uh, Elisa and I both <laughs> had the privilege of, of being among the very first people to see actual data from the Webb telescope. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, for me, I think my favorite of the ones released so far is the deep field image. Um, and that, you know, it may not be the most flashy of the images that we released, but it has the most, I think, the most astronomical significance. Uh, the, the most distant galaxies ever are seen in that image. Um, some of them have, have yet to be discovered. We, we did some spectroscopic analysis of those galaxies and we did find one that was 13.2 billion light years. Uh, that, that light has been traveling across the universe for 13.2 billion wow. years. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay, can you tell us what spectra, uh, spectroscopy is really quickly? Oh yeah, sorry. He's, he's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's basically we just breaking that in light. really fast. <laughs> yeah, taking light and breaking it down into its component parts. So like a prism breaks the sunlight into the rainbow that's essentially a spectrum. You're looking at all of the component light that makes up white light of the sun when you see a rainbow. And it's a similar thing with spectroscopy. We'll take all the light that a galaxy is emitting and break it down into its component parts and then sort of analyze it and look at, you know, what, where, where is it emitting strongly and what wavelength is that coming in at? And that's kind of how we can tell how far away it is because the universe is expanding and that light that we study is being shifted into the infrared uh, due to a process called redshifting. All right, I am gonna do a quick follow-up because we already, we have another question that actually asked, it's Skilloper who just says, who, what exactly does infrared mean? So Elisa, you wanna break that down? No, let's see, okay. Let's start with the electromagnetic spectrum. So if you guys are familiar, we're familiar with the visible light, right? Cause that's the one that we can see. That's the one that, mm -hmm. you know, we interact with the world with, but beyond the infrared or beyond the visible, and to the right of the spectrum, I guess you could say, is sort of the infrared. So that's the lower wavelength, or the, I should say, longer wavelength, lower energy. And then on the other side, you know, higher energy, on the, I would say the left, I'm going to just say the left, I don't know what that actually means. But on this side, we've got like x-rays, the gamma rays, the high energy. So let's forget about those for a second. <laughs> let's go back to the visible. Actually, 
and then go into the infrared. So infrared is also is light. It travels at the speed of light. And even though we can't parse specific colors from infrared doesn't mean that they don't exist. Like there's very particular wavelengths that exist within infrared. But you can think of infrared as heat. Like I think that's the easiest way to put it. So let's say you're like a firefighter and a lot of firefighters have like infrared vision because you can see through the gas and dust, which is essentially what we're doing. It's the same reason why we even have an infrared space telescope to begin with. It's because we want to see beyond the gas and the dust to see, you know, those young stars. In this case, for the firefighter, they're seeing, you know, where the people are. <laughs> So we can save them. And then, of course, like if you've ever seen Predator, you know, the Predator can see if you're hiding somewhere because, you know, you're behind the tree. <laughs> so that's <laughs> essentially what infrared is. It's like a heat. Um, so you can think of it as light. So you're seeing like the heat of young stars and things that are not really, really hot, but still kind of hot. So it's just another way to see things, essentially. <laughs> that was a fantastic breakdown of light. I have to say we were in x-rays we were in predator and we also so had firefighters. I don't think I've heard one that good in a while so thank you okay I have a final question for you all and I'd like to hear kind of from all of you the question is from Taylor Andrea artwork and they say how does one get a job in this area so Elisa Joseph I want to hear about your experiences and then Natasha I want to hear about how you like even decided to start up your accounts and become the creator that you have become today. So we can go from top down on my <laughs> screen. So we'll start with Elisa. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I want to begin by saying there's no right or wrong way to get involved. Like if you have an interest, just pursue that interest. Like for me, as you can see, I didn't really have like a set plan in my head. I'm just like, I really like art. I really like astronomy. I'm going to make it work, you know? So like, and that's the cool thing about working at like Space Telescope or NASA is that you can have different skills that you can apply to something else you like. So you can like multiple things. So maybe you're a writer and you want to do science writing. Maybe you're, you know, an artist and you want to do graphic design. Like it's scientific illustration. Like this is all possible. If you're talking like specifically like image processing, I would say, Definitely an astronomy degree is helpful because you do work closely with the scientists and you develop an intuition about what you sh are seeing in the data and what you should see and basically how to treat it. And then also, like, I think it's good to just, like, have a creative job on the side, whether that's, like, painting or just sort of any sort of, you know, creative channel is great. Doesn't mean you necessarily have to get a degree, um, but if you want to, that's great. And then you can also just watch YouTube videos about astronomy or vice versa. So, yeah, just whatever you like, just, you know, do it. I encourage it all the way. <laughs> I love that. Natasha? Yeah, so um, back in 2019, I was seeing all these really funny videos online. And I was like, where, where can I see these? These are hilarious. Um, and so I found out about TikTok. And I literally just downloaded it because I just wanted to watch a video. It's just like past the time. Um, and I realized, you know, if I wanted to post my own videos, people have always found it very cool that I cannot see color. And so I thought, you know, maybe I'll share some stuff about that. And here I am today. And it's, I mean, it's funny because at the beginning, it really was just me, you know, doing my makeup or painting and just doing the things that I enjoy doing anyway. And, you know, making a video about it and putting it online. But, you know, now I'm here talking to people at NASA about like accessibility and like ed educating about blindness and like the fact that I've, I, I feel like I've come very far from where I started. Um, and so the fact that I'm, I'm getting to do this is just incredible because it's what I care about. It's, it's, it's my life. And I love that I can, I, you know, people can learn from me. Um, and I've, I love, I've also loved learning from you all. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you so much for just being here. So Joseph, we're ending with you. Okay. Uh, yeah. So as far back as I can remember, I was always infatuated with the concept of astronomy and just understanding our place in the universe and looking up at night and just wondering about what's up there. Um, so I went to school for astronomy and astrophysics, and that's what I got my degree in. But then I started working professionally right after that, doing like calibration work for the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Um, and it was during that time where I, I thought I was going to go off to grad school and get a PhD and sort of take a traditional, you know, uh, academic route but it didn't seem like the right path for me. Um, and all the while I had always been interested in, in art and painting and music and photography. So I pursued all those interests while I was working. 
and managed to figure out a way to pull it all together. Um, moved into doing public outreach work for Chandra. And that was where I started doing the image processing. It was with x-ray data from Chandra. And then making connections through Chandra, made my connections to Space Telescope to work with uh, Hubble and Webb. Um, so like Elisa said, there really is no single path that would get you to a job like this. Yeah. But there are so many opportunities that are, you know, beyond sort of the PhD astronomer track. If you want to be involved in astronomy, there are plenty of jobs. It's just, you know, you got to look out for them and pursue your interests. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so yeah. much for that. And I mean, hey, you can also do comms. I actually just really like space. So yeah. <laughs> there you go. And so, yeah, well, unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for today. Joe, Elisa, Natasha, thank you all, not only for being here, but literally just for the work that you do, like helping all of us understand new perspectives, whether that is understanding black and white space telescope data to literally understanding a new way that people can actually see our real life. And so it has been the utmost pleasure and honor. And so thank you for everything. And so to our uh, folks still viewing too, uh, if you want to keep up with the James Webb Space Telescope mission, definitely follow at NASA Webb or at space underscore telescopes on Instagram to never miss one of these just jaw-dropping images with really great alt text. Um, <laughs> and so, and thanks again to everybody for tuning in and for all of your questions. This has been super fun. I hope you have a great day and we hope to see you next time. So thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.